Randall Carlson stays with us, randallcarlson.com. And in a few moments, we'll tell you about the uh, Randall Carlson project. So we were talking about how the ancients, you know, they had this, this incredible memory back in time. They knew about the cycle of cataclysms, uh, floods and ice ages, but they were to a certain extent able to also anticipate collisions with comets, right? This is what it would appear. Uh, and just, uh, we certainly could do such a thing today. I mean, you know, in uh, 2029, we're going to have a relatively close encounter with the the cosmic object that is called, um, not fate. Um, I think it must be, I must be getting late here on my end. Um, it'll come to me in a second. Yeah, the, there's an object that'll come by uh, in uh 2029, and depending on uh, its encounter with the Earth, its trajectory could be altered so that in 2036, it comes back even closer, which is still not going to, probably not going to impact the Earth, but that cannot be ruled out. And uh, if this... Oh, uh, Apophis. I think it's Apophis. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that Apophis. I think it's Apophis, but but Apophis, it, yeah. in any case, um, yeah. So there is that possibility. Now we have, of course, you know the the scientific means to do it, and the question would be, obviously, if they could predict on a long scale, like in decades or centuries ahead of time, they must have had some kind of scientific expertise and. Again, it would be too complicated to try to go in without diagrams and and things, but many of the ancient structures, you know, we're learning are all cosmically aligned. Uh, We can see, you know, the most prominent and well-known is Stonehenge, which has a midsummer sunrise, uh, solstice sunrise alignment. And we know that probably at this point, hundreds of other structures around the planet have been shown to have uh, cosmic alignments. Well, this means that to some extent you could be able to track celestial motion. Now, I don't think anybody, I don't, I don't think anybody has really cracked the code yet of what these ancient peoples were able to do and how they were able to track celestial motion. We do know that it seems a foregone conclusion that they were tracking celestial motion with a high degree of precision and accuracy, and that they did this over many generations at a time. Now, why would they do this? I mean, you do not need a a, a huge megalithic structure in order to, uh, you know, know when uh, it's time to plant uh, your seeds and when it's time to reap the harvest. You know, if you're trying to determine the cycles and seasons of an annual year, all you need really is a stick in the ground that's all in a circle around it that's all you need you don't need to build gigantic hinges with megalithic stones or huge temples with their axes aligned to the uh cosmically auspicious points on the horizon whether it's solar or lunar but if you're trying to predict what is coming down the celestial pipeline those kinds of things would become very helpful because as the Earth is shifting around on its axis, here's the thing. You can put sticks in the ground, and that's good for you know a few decades. But after a while, just like our calendar drifts off, and if we didn't correct the calendar every four years with a leap day, it wouldn't be long before there was a huge disconnect between our calendar and the seasons. Yeah, we'd have and winter in August. That's right. That's right. That would eventually happen. If we if we transpose to a larger scale, maybe it's the similar kind of a thing is that, you know, you want to create structures that are going to endure for long periods of time so that that displacement due to this very slow processional axial motion could be detected. So that's one possibility. Uh, I think it goes more than that, obviously. And I think we're only really just on the threshold of being able to understand uh, what ancient peoples really did know. Uh, The problem we've had up to this point, Richard, is that there were assumptions made about the capabilities and the scientific 
understanding of how the world works and, and how nature works, there were certain assumptions that ancient peoples were pretty much scientifically illiterate. They were ruled mostly by fear and superstition, so they made stuff up in order to try to have some kind of coherent understanding of, of the universe or the world and how it all worked. To me, that is like a completely obsolete 19th century misconception about what peoples may or may not have known thousands of years ago. I think it's clear at this point that we're in a, in a position now where we really need to be reevaluating ancient times and what peoples knew. Because, see, I mean, we were talking earlier, you know, that, that people have been living around. We now have skeletal evidence of modern humans 180 to 200,000 years ago. Earlier in our discussion, I mentioned the Emian, which was a period that ended around 104,000 years ago. It lasted for roughly the same amount of time that our modern Holocene has lasted about 10,000, 11,000 years, right? And that was always considered to be an analog for our, pre, for our present interglacial. I have now recently just started really looking into the Emian as being a period during which we may have made incredible advances in science, in technology, in the uh, establishment of civilization and so on. But the catastrophe that ended the e Emian, and that's spelled double E-M-I-A-N, the catastrophe that ended that uh, epoch, that era, that age, if you want to call it that, about 104,000 years ago, may have wiped out whatever had been preceding it, because that was actually now the beginning of a, of a environmental or climatic phase called the late Wisconsin Glacial. And we saw this rapid expansion of glaciers uh, worldwide. And then several times throughout the last 104,000 years, the glaciers have, they have waxed and waned, sometimes growing enormously, even bigger than they were during the last glacial maximum, say 15 to 18,000 years ago, uh, and even bigger than that. And, and some of the evidence for that is, from the moraines deposited around the edges of the glaciers. And other evidence is the, the drop in sea levels, which from some of these earlier glacial expansions may have been 50 to 75 feet lower than it was during the so-called late Wisconsin, which is now generally dated to have begun the last, the final phase of this 104,000 year glacial cycle is the whole glacial cycle is called the Wisconsin after the state of Wisconsin where some of the earlier deposits and evidence of this glacial age were studied right so it's called the Wisconsin mm -hmm. the Wisconsin was broken into about four different phases the final phase the late Wisconsin commenced a right around 26,000 years ago so if we go back to 27,000 years ago, we back up the big, co the great cosmic clock, the processional hand of the clock, uh, to 26 or 27,000 years ago, it's on the cusp of Pisces Aquarius, just like it is now. And shortly with, after that, or within that narrow window of time, there was a major climate disruption, and it led to a rapid re-expansion of the glaciers worldwide. That lasted for about 13,000 years until the lower younger Dryas boundary, uh, like I said, around 12,900 years ago. So I have been really interested, and maybe we can get come back uh, in a future discussion after I've learned more about this very interesting analog to our modern times, because here's the thing. When you understand the nature of environmental volatility, such as has prevailed throughout the ice ages, it becomes apparent that the the uh, the process of building a civilization would be very challenging because the foundation of being able to build a civilization is agriculture. You've got to be able to feed people. Otherwise, you're, you can't build cities. You, you know, you can, all of the things like Plato was saying, once only once you've attended to the necessities of life, can you turn your attention to, to higher learning and things like that, to to science, to art, to cultural activity and so on.
Yeah, well, you can't you can't figure out how to to uh, build an aqueduct if you're out hunting and gathering. That's right. That's exactly right. Yes, and so I'm looking now into the Eemian as a possible analog during a time when the climate and environment of Earth would have been favorable for agriculture and the rise of civilization. The problem is, is between our present round, the Holocene, during which all of our modern civilizations have arisen, and the Eemian, we've got 100,000 or you know 90,000 years of this oscillating glacial interglacial cycle that could pretty much erase most of the evidence that we would find for the preexistence of this civilization or culture that may have existed back then. And, and we still don't know what are the factors driving these changes. You know, when you think about it, as I'm sure you have, Richard, and, and I hope the listeners also think about this, what it would actually mean, you know, that if, if you were suddenly transported in a time machine back to 14,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, and you're in the northern United States where New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Detroit, Chicago, uh, Madison, Milwaukee, the Twin Cities, um, you know, uh, Portland, Seattle, all of these cities that are now, you know, all of these areas that now have these great cities, that was all under thousands of feet of glacial ice. And it was there, and then a few thousand years later, it's gone. And we're still trying to understand what processes cause such a dramatic transition between uh, it, and and we we don't really have the answer. That's why I get really annoyed when I hear people saying, "Well, the science on climate change is settled." It's far far from settled. There are things going on in this climate and in the history of climate on Earth that far exceed anything we've experienced in the last few centuries. Right, because we're experiencing the the cosmological season of summer when it's warm. Uh, again, though, we have no memory of what came before, which was long periods of winter, the season of winter, and we're, we're going to yeah. head into winter again, cosmologically speaking. Um, yes, and I want to just talk a few minutes before the the break at the bottom of the hour, and then we're going to open up the phone lines, and that is uh, the uh, the um, sacred geometry and how that relates to the cosmological clock. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that's a very interesting thing. Um, and this is something I learned and, and came to realize early on in my studies of geometry. Now, my studies of geometry were initially uh, inspired by trying to understand the methodology of the ancient architects and builders. And what I found out in my research back in the 1970s uh, and then confirmed subsequently through many years of, subs of other research was that all over the ancient world from the dawn of civilization during like the early Neolithic, late Neolithic, when we're going back 4,000, 5,000 years ago, the Bronze Age, all the way down, let's say, to oh, the, the, the period, the Gothic Age, the Middle Ages of, of modern uh, modern history, uh, meaning seven, eight hundred years ago, we find these master builders at work, and this is in virtually all continents that we know of, with the exception of Antarctica. We don't, and we don't know what may what surprises may await us under the ice sheets of Antarctica, but all the other continents have evidence of these uh, these inspired constructions and whether it's the megalithic stuff in northern Europe, you know, whether it's um, the pyramids and temples of Egypt, whether it's the monumental earthwork structures in eastern North America, uh, you know, whether it's the Gothic cathedrals. I mean, we could go on, whether it's the, um, the uh, ancient, amazing Buddhist and Vedic structures in Indochina. Uh, <clears throat> If we start looking at those and studying their design and their construction, one of the things that I realized early on was that it seemed like the same principles were being applied across the spectrum. 
so that if you look at some of the megalithic stone circles in the British Isles, and a prominent example is Stonehenge, there is a very precise geometry, a geometric template beneath the design of Stonehenge, right? Well, if you begin to look and you begin to understand the design principles of all these ancient structures all over the world, spanning a time of nearly four or 5,000 years, here's the, the, the really wild thing is that they all appear to have been working from the same template. Now, obviously, you can look at a, one of the great you know, Buddhist temples in Cambodia, and it's going to be very distinct from you know, a Mayan temple in the Yucatan, or, you know, a megalithic structure in England, or one of the great monumental earthwork structures in North America. But underneath, be below all of these, is a template that was used that linked the structure with certain geometric proportions and then oriented that towards the cosmos. And we see that over and over and over again. Interestingly, I commented that earlier, if you look, take that 26,000 year cycle and you use 50 seconds of arc per year that we were talking about in our first, um, the first part of this, this conversation, that 50 seconds of arc per year leads to a season, four seasons within that, that are traditionally, uh, have been associated with the four fixed signs of the zodiac. So, you, for example, you can find prophecies in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is, is you know, witnessing the the four beasts of the apocalypse. Right. Sorry, Randall, I got to jump in. We're uh, we're at the bottom of the hour here. We'll pick up on this when we come back. Opening up the phone lines as well. Randall, before we go to the calls, I just want to finish up on that point. Um, so we were talking about the relationship between sacred geometry, uh, which is embedded in all of these ancient structures, the, the, the foundation, the blueprint, no matter how old, uh, whether the, the, you know, there's thousands of years apart from when certain structures were built, they all have this sacred geometry encoded. So talk to me how the the sacred geometry that we can find, for example, in the internal uh, angles uh, of these structures relates to things like the great ear and, um, you know, the, the, uh, the cosmological clock. Sure. All right. Well, a good example is, and one of my favorites, is, you know, we, one of the things I've studied into a lot is the, you know, you, you, you look at sacred geometry and you can see, uh, the two-dimensional manifestation of it, but it's also three-dimensional, obviously. So you go from planar geometry to solid geometry. Now, in, in circling back to Plato again, Plato wrote <clears throat> about uh, the five regular polyhedra that are often called platonic solids. And there's a, a set of them. I won't go into why there only can be five, but they're there's one, there's three of them that are based on equilateral triangles, a tetrahedron, an octahedron, and an icosahedron. There's one that's based upon squares, and that's the cube. And then there's one more that's based upon pentagons, and that's the dodecahedron. Now, if you take a dodecahedron and you measure the angles at each of the vertices, and there's 20 vertices in a dodecahedron, 12 pentagonal faces, 20 vertices. If you look and, and measure the angles of each of the edges of a pentagon, it's 108 degrees. And then with each pentagon, there's 12, there's, there's five vertices. So that's, um, you know, 108 times five, which is 540. And then there's 12 of those faces, which gives you a total of 6,480 degrees that measures uh, the three-dimensional polyhedra of a dodecahedron. Well, what's interesting about that is if you go back to the great year processional cycle, 50 arc seconds per year, what you do is if you, you go the 360 times uh, the 50, and what you end up with is 25,920 years. Well, divide that by four to get each of the seasons, and each season, which consists of three uh 
three signs of the zodiac, the, the time that it takes for the vernal equinox to transit through three signs of the zodiac. Let's go back uh, to the beginning of the age of Taurus, which was then followed by the age of Aries, which was followed by the age of Pisces. Those three together constitute one season of the great year. Well, of the four seasons, each of them last 6,480 years, the same as the number that measures the angles of a dodecahedron. So that same number measures not only the spatial relationships in one of the beautiful regular polyhedra that Plato described as being, in effect, a model of the universe. It also describes this cycle of time that in ancient records was symbolized by the four fixed signs of the zodiac and that sit at the middle of each of these four epochs within the, within the great year cycle. And they, they were symbolized by the four animals or four creatures or beasts, as they're described in the book of Revelation, the beast of the apocalypse, a bull, which would be Taurus, a lion, which would be Leo, uh, uh, a scorpion, or, or rather an eagle, which actually referred to Scorpio because Aquila, the eagle, which is very close to Scorpio in the sky, would rise at the same time each year and would therefore mark, was a marker of that same time. And then finally, there was a man figure, an anthropomorphic figure, or an angel that was associated with Aquarius. So each of those seasons was measured by the same number, 6,480. And then they were each uh, composed of three months, cosmic months, that, like we talked about earlier, had an average length of 2,160 years. Well, going back, and this is just one other example out of numerous examples I could cite, but going back to the cube, you have six square faces. Each face is four angles of 90 degrees, so you've got 360 degrees, and then that times six, that gives you 2,160 degrees measures the cube, or as it's called in mathematical terms, a hexahedron. So 2,160, that number, measures the number of degrees in a cube, and it measures the number of uh, years in a platonic month or a cosmic month, if you want to call it that. Right. It's also so, a, a zod It's also a, a, an epoch or a, or a, one of the zodiac signs. Yes, it's, it's the time. It's the average time during which the vernal equinox passes through one of the 12 signs of the zodiac and they're kind of referred to as you, you can think of them as cosmic months just like yes. there are 12 months in our year now let me quickly ask you this when we talk about a month where does the term what's the origin of the term month hmm. moon right the moon, moon, moon is the right, cycle right, of the right. moon yeah yeah well get this the measure of the moon almost precisely is 2160 miles in diameter oh lord <laughs> Yeah, so that's wow. that's very very interesting to me. It um, is indeed. Let's take a, let's take a call here, Randall. Uh, sure. Myad is in New York. Myad, welcome to Coast. Myad, are you there? Myad has walked away from the phone. Okay, Sounds let's like say we hi. Lost my ad. That's okay. Let's say hi to Mark in Florida. Mark, welcome to Coast. It's been really really enlightening listening to you and Randall especially about the uh, parabolic and elliptical orbits. It reminds me of that little Uma thing that passed through our solar system about a year ago. But um, I, uh, and, and I especially appreciate the way you explain axial precession. It's very hard for people to understand. So I wanted to just share how I've always thought about it. I, I think of the Earth going around the sun in its plane, and then we have a skewer going from the South Pole up through the North Pole. That's our axis. And our axis actually changes through time between about 22 degrees off the vertical to maybe 24 yep. and a half degrees. And if yep. you think about about a uh, ceiling, like maybe there's a, a, a laser light pointing out of this uh, uh, 
axis. And, and, and basically, as, as time passes, your 26,000 years, which is basically 72 years times 360 degrees, basically yep. a little circles are uh, scribbled out on the ceiling. Uh, and so basically what it is is a basically uh, – we're pointing at different stars throughout time. And so I view it as like when we were a child and we would pull a top and the top would spin. And basically, if you looked at its top axis, it would basically, uh, it kind of goes in the circle of its own. So that's really what axial precession is. And one day, because of axial precession, Anchorage, Alaska will be a tropical beachfront property and basically it's all just a matter of the moon and the oceans and stuff all right that's uh, helpful mark i appreciate it's been, uh excellent listening to you all Thanks, right thank mark. you for that and, and your analogies were were quite appropriate all right myad has rejoined us in new york myad welcome to coast thank you for that richard that is usually doesn't happen um fascinating program I'd like to start, and um, I have a, a point of clarification or correction, if you will, and a, a two- or three-part question that will be brief, and I, I'll listen over the computer, and hopefully I can get uh, things on stream. But first of all, you um, initially may a contradictory statement or statements both in, and I'm going to be reading Hamlet's Mill. I absolutely have heard about it. And then when you said, um, uh, Solom realized that the, um, uh, how, how did you put it, that the, um, uh, that they knew much more than than the Greeks or whatever, but if you, and I'd like to know if you've ever read it and familiar with it, it's called Stolen Legacy, The Egyptian Origins of Western Philosophy. Philosophy is not a Greek word, by George J.M. James, and uh, J.M. as in uh, Marvin James, and he actually explains how Athens was antithetical. Uh, I think that's why they were looking to execute Socrates, because once the... And you they gave a good account of um, the Solon uh, story. Um, all of that information was brought through Kemet slash Egypt. That's where we get our word chemistry from. And uh, Pythagoras spent the same about ten years there, and others, and the ones who didn't have as much experience there. That information was passed down, but Athens was not on board initially. Um, the uh, first part of my question is: um, you have an intriguing title. Certainly, to uh, your forthcoming podcast, please give us some enticing preview, and when we can um, start to to tune in. Um, the second part of my question is going to be some brief comment regarding another book that I'd like you to reference, whether you're familiar with that George uh, basically he hasn't been on for some time. What George introduced us to is by Robert W. Sullivan, Sullivan IV, I.V., uh, and Esquire, and his cinema symbolism, a guide to esoteric imagery in popular movies. And this is such a powerful book. Uh, for some reason, I decided to get it. Okay, but Maya, yes, I got to get you to get right to the question because yeah, we're running out yes, of time here. The preference it says this. Uh, he, he did the royal arc of Enoch. He said the impact of Masonic ritual philosophy and symbolism, uh, published 2012. He says, so dark the con of man, in quotes, explaining Masonic, solar, occult, and Enochian symbolism in modern cinema. So he's also a master mason. I'd like you to explain a little bit about what's all that about and whether you can relate okay. to that. He also mentioned... Maya, we don't have time.
that. I'm, I, we don't have time for all that. We're almost out of time. Let me just uh, get uh, Randall to maybe tease what's coming up on his uh, podcast, Squaring the Circle. Yeah, well, I think we'll address some of that in there. Um, I've also got, you know, there's. I'm also doing another podcast called Cosmographia, and we've got 108 episodes of that up there, and I talk about a whole bunch of things. And the only reason I'm shifting over and doing a new podcast is because the team that I'm working with is all scattered around right now. Three of them are in Egypt doing research right now, and so we're not able to get up regular content every week like we had been. So I'm creating an auxiliary co- podcast in order to keep more uh, regular stream of podcast coming out. So it should be up and coming in about two weeks. Uh, two two websites, RandallCarlson.com and HowTube.com will be where you can get specific information. And you'll also find a whole lot of other stuff available that's already up there available that uh, – some of it, a lot of it's free. Some of it is, you know, I, I got to make a little bit of money off of this stuff to keep going. But there's a lot of information, RandallCarlson.com and HowTube.com. Those are the two websites, the relevant websites that you should go to and look at. And we'll be, we'll be fielding some questions and things there. I'd like to find out more about the two books you referenced. They both sound very interesting. Uh, and we just don't have time right now to get into it. But if I can get those two references, I will look into it. All right. And very quickly, the Randall Carlson Project. Tell us about it. we got about okay, two minutes. So I've been involved my, as I've been a builder and a teacher. That's what I've been doing all my life. How do you put those two things together? Well, it seemed to me build a school. And I have been involved with teaching adults. I've been involved with teaching children. I've organized numerous classes for uh young people that were being homeschooled and over 20 to 30 years of doing this i've developed some ideas about where i think education modern uh, institutionalized education has gone wrong and what we need to do to to correct that trajectory and start raising healthy children again who are uh understand critical reasoning who are curious questioning and i'm going to be putting a lot of that information up on my new web on the on the website and you'll be able to again uh you'll be able to go there i don't have too much up there now although there are some lectures in cosmographia and a few other places where i am talking about it in more detail so if you go to randallcarlson.com or howtube.com you are going to be able to access that information as it's uh being published over the next couple of months Right. And again, in this, uh, with the Randall Carlson project, you want to sort of uh, combine or bring together uh, ancient wisdom, sacred geology, along with evolving technologies. Yes, yes. Uh, that's very much it, Richard. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gratified, Richard, that you seem to have had a really good grasp of everything I'm trying to get out in this kind of truncated fashion. But yeah, you got it. It's It's about combining ancient and traditional methods of learning, along with some of the cutting edge breakthroughs in science and technology and engineering. Uh, and then looking at all of that uh, with the underlying matrix of the natural order. And I'm a very firm believer that people of all walks of life and all ages need to get out and learn about the secrets and stories that our earth and, and our terrestrial nature have to tell us. And they are some amazing stories. And in, in that light, I regularly do tours to take people out and teach them the secret language of the landscapes, if you want to put it that way. My, my academic training, even though I'm a college dropout, I will admit I was, um, I was majoring in geology and astronomy uh, as a, as a, university student. And I've continued those studies, you know, obviously for many decades now. And I incorporate a lot of that into these tours that we do. They're not just sightseeing tours. They're community building um, and learning about ancient wisdom and science, the overlap, and learning about, as I said, the secrets of the ancient landscapes. RandallCarlson.com and HowTube.com. Randall, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Richard. Look forward to talking with you again, my friend. All right, we will. Thank you. For George Noy, George Knapp, Connie Willis, Lisa Gar, Lisa Lyon, Stephanie Smith, Tom Danheiser, Dan Galanti, Michael Cozio, Donna Walker, Chris Burroughs, Sean Lattisor, 
I'm Richard Serra. Thank you for your ears and your voices, your beautiful voices. Until next time, so long for now.